Street Medical Dispatch calling Detroit Receiving Hospital. Chicago Hospital 11 and Chicago AC 11. Detroit Team, go ahead. 84 Alpha 11 to Detroit Receiving Hospital. How do you read this unit? The magic didn't work this time. We were too late to make a difference. It happens sometimes. Someone we don't even know, perhaps don't even want to know, will touch us, will make us think, will break through our shell. I got an 88-year-old father. And I think about this sometime when I see him come through here like this. I think about my dad. When something does get through, a lot of us tend to push it down, block it out, try and carry on with our work. We tell ourselves it doesn't get to us, but it does. Death can be a powerful stressor, but then there's no lack of stress in what we do, is there? Sometimes we can feel inspired by our own power because we save lives. And sometimes we can be demoralized by our own powerlessness because we don't save lives, we lose lives. This and is Dr. Frank Ockberg, a psychiatrist, a, a consultant here at Detroit Receiving, and a professor at Michigan State University. He knows a lot about the emotional impact of stress and trauma on victim and caregiver alike. Burnout is a chronic condition, or at least it's caused by having been placed in a situation of, often, of relentless responsibility. And there are certain institutions in which people seem to have more of this. People who are prison workers, people who work in school systems, people who work in hospitals. We've all felt the pressure of that responsibility whether we're fresh out of school or veterans. Like Dr. Sweeney. He's vice chief of emergency medicine at Detroit Receiving Hospital. And he has the overnight shift tonight. He's been up all day, and he knows it's going to be a long 12 hours before he gets to go home again. So how's it looking tonight? What's the uh, I haven't been out there yet. There's a door we, we walk through right here that we'll, that we'll be able to tell. It's, busy. it's barely 6.30 on Friday night, and the emergency department modules are already filling up. Add a few codes, Very a few complicated cases, and the adrenaline can really start pumping. It may help make the night go faster, but can leave you exhausted by morning. Mostly not very sick, actually. What are you, two in the Dr. Sweeney's been on the front line long enough to have learned to deal with the pressure and to have helped some of the rest of us do the same. I think he's the young one. 
He starts his shift with a briefing. And what, then what do I do? I mean, I get, I do another CPK. I already, he bump, just had it done. If, I, if it doesn't bump, then he, then he, what, then he goes. Yeah. Okay. These cases are all his responsibility now, at least till morning. Because he had this has to stay. So this is what's equivalent to being normal for him, right? Is right. You and I yeah, do? but on the previous cardiograms, he actually had our waves. The pace can be relentless. So can the responsibility. All those decisions, big and small. Decisions which affect our patients. When it gets too much for too long, the result can be burnout. We all know the symptoms, though we don't talk about it much. Feelings of helplessness, demoralization, Avoidance, depression, exhaustion, difficulty sleeping, headaches, loss of appetite. Does it mean we're burnt out? Not necessarily. Burnout is a cumulative process, one we only need worry about if the symptoms become chronic and start to interfere with our work and our home life. It may look quiet here outside the operating room, but that's deceptive. It doesn't get noisy and crowded like in the emergency department on a busy night. And it doesn't get as intimate as in the critical care units upstairs. Somehow it seems a little more focused more clinical, more controlled. But the pressure's just as intense, just as real. It's a very intense atmosphere. You know, anything goes wrong. You know, a suture wrong at the right at, at a particular time when you're trying to sew something up. Uh, there's a tremendous pressure, and in between these pressures, you have to relax. You, you can't be keyed up and tight all the time. And the, generally, the tighter the situation, the, uh, the harder things, the more you have to sort of fool around in between, the more you have to look on the light side, because otherwise you'd crack. It's not the big things that suddenly put them over the edge. What's interesting is that often a tiny little straw, uh, some uh, offhand little comment or, or just uh, getting the wrong result or just being given the wrong x-ray or just picking up the wrong uh, piece of paper. Once a guy loses his sense of humor. Once a guy can't smile, once a guy can't say good morning, once a guy can't kid with somebody else, you gotta worry. A sense of humor probably is our best defense. Being able to smile or joke, it can relieve the tension, even if it might not always seem appropriate to an outsider. After all, we deal with so much pain and suffering that often the only way we can talk about the things that touch us, that upset us, is by finding the humor in them. <laughs> I love working here! There's a certain rhythm to our work. Especially here in the emergency department. can be overwhelmed at times, often for hours. And then, suddenly, it's quiet, like now.
Now is the time to take a break, swap a story, tell a joke, vent any pent up frustration. Got up, wanted to get out, has a promo line, right? Goes to pull it, we no, no, no. But these all important moments never seem to last long enough. 30. Just when we're starting to relax, something always happens. All night. 84 Alpha 101, I'm in number 237. We're in Rogers facility. Code 2, we have a 36-year-old female. Female hit by a truck. It's Trump. Pardon me? It's not clear. I think it was a, a car versus truck. A garbage truck? Did you say garbage? Oh, I thought you said a garbage truck. I'm a little big over there. Uh, plenty of trouble breathing. 15 minutes, leaders, two minutes. Uh, he's an ex-IV drug user. Uh, we're having difficulty starting line. Uh, we're presently in transport. We'll be there in about eight minutes. She's an IVDA. It, it was an advanced unit. This is an IVDA? Yeah, it was an advanced unit. They couldn't get a line in. He's downstairs changing. He'll be on the dock. Did you count? The countdown to a code like this one can be pretty nerve-wracking. Even when we've been through it a hundred times. The anticipation, the preparation, the checking and double-checking. No matter how well we're briefed, we've learned to expect the unexpected. This now is having difficulty getting lungs down the truck so loud. We got a little change? She can manage? Yeah, yeah, she just wouldn't cooperate. She's grabbing, she's incredibly ETOH. Yeah, she has good neuro. She's got an alveolar rate crack. She's pretty unstable. She's talking okay, though, right? She's moving air. Yeah, she's moving air. We had to constantly suction her. Hi, honey, relax. Relax your hands. She was having some problems swallowing. Lay back, lay back, lay back, lay back, lay back. She had a sign so far in the farm for her to see all the way down there. Okay, okay. Take it easy. Ah! Take it easy. Multiple codes, complicated ones like these. This is recess at its best. To an outsider, it can look like it's getting out of control, but it isn't. This is what we've been trained for. All of us are prioritizing, making decisions, thinking fast. We're alert to what's going on around us, our patients, each other. <laughs> We're all part of a team. We're in it together. We're also pushing ourselves to our limits. We're right out there on the edge. It's exciting. It's what draws a lot of us to this work. And yet, it's exhausting too. It's a routine that can eventually get to be too much. And it can wear us down. And it can burn us out. This kind of an environment for some of us and at some stages of our life is a tonic. It gives us purpose. It gives us a sense of doing something that is uh, one of the most remarkable human endeavors you can do. You're, you're healing the wounded. You're there where the action is. You're, you're part of something that is, uh, it, it has allure. And there's nothing wrong with the drama of coming to work in, in the urban mash unit of Detroit. On the other hand, after a while, that aspect of working in a place no longer has its special flavor. It, it may not... Uh, bring out of you uh, rejuvenation, creativity, the good kind of arousal. And instead, because of many factors, uh, often things going on in the rest of our lives, not what's going on here, 
Will we lose that elasticity? Uh, we get more emotionally fragile. Uh, and, and really, we get hard. Housekeeping to recess, please. Housekeeping to recess. This is the aftermath of a cold, in which we have to have it. I am responsible for setting it back up within 10 minutes, ready for another. So that's part of it. Once I turn him over to him. But the guys will help me. Watch yourself. I already chewed out some of those doctors. One of the things that can bring you down off that high in a hurry is the risk of infectious disease. A lot of patients admitted to hospitals like ours are HIV positive or have AIDS. Having to deal with that uncertainty is yet another stressor. Now you know it's positive. You know it's positive. To me, it's like the are positive. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to We've had three colds back to back. Big ones. I mean, I haven't been out of this room in three or four hours. So it's kind of tough. And we got some new docs, and that makes it a little hairier than usual because they um, tend to be a little sloppy, as you can see. So, uh, and then if you don't get it put back up and you're not ready for the next one, you're in trouble. So far, it's been another busy shift for Carol Taylor. I'm, I'm out of gas. I'm due for a break. She's getting tired, maybe even a little irritable. That's when we need to find ways to ease off. We all have our ways of relaxing. A cup of coffee, something to eat, a few minutes off in the lounge. That can help. Is this bed four? Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. Slug the other guy? Yeah. He wants to see a psychiatrist. Sometimes you put your head down for a while and you close your eyes for 15 or 20 minutes. That helps. But, you know, tonight there's always been something getting in the way. But the second time, if you're up the second night, um, you go home and sleep, so you, you sort of start to adjust your clock a little bit. But the first one is kind of... Uh, I mean, some of these, these people live at night. I don't know how they... It's bizarre. Getting enough sleep is often easier said than done. Too little for too long can really grind us down. So we have to be careful. We have to take care of ourselves. It's important to keep fit. To eat the right things to get a little sleep whenever we can. I've woken up in the middle of the night and just bolted out of bed looking for a patient's chart in my room. Uh, seriously, I, I mean, I've scoured the room looking for... I've called into the hospital. <laughs> I once called the hospital to the person who was on call here asking if I put in a central line into a patient, <laughs> if I started a catheter underneath this patient's, you know, a serious procedure. So you wake up with these delusions. We've all had the occasional delusion when tired. Have gotten angry at a patient. Felt bitter at the senselessness of what we sometimes see. Excuse me, I need to listen. We don't have any. That's normal. That's human. But we can't let it interfere with our work. How many old two tanks do we have in the department? You know, it's only... Okay, that's two in the Are they full? Yeah, I fill them all. There's one there. Okay. I just put, I just fill one. Two in resuscitation, there's one there. Because look at this here. In here. You know, I forgot. I didn't know this was in here. I only have four. You know what? I know. So you know what? You guys are going to have to take this. Take one of them now. Listen, can I finish? Can I finish? Do you know where you're supposed to take it out? I have to go outside or something. On many nights, the anger and menace of the city streets can sweep into the hospital. It's an emotionally charged environment. Uh, we know that people don't want to be here. They're not coming in for a well baby check. 
Um, they're coming in because they're injured or they're hurt or, they, or they're sick and, and oftentimes they're angry and you see people that are very emotionally charged and it brings out emotions in the healthcare giver that probably they would wish that they didn't, they, uh, didn't have to bring out. I mean, we patch them up, we ship them out, we deal with them for months, let's say, in the intensive care unit, go out, and they'll just come back next week. They'll come back drunk and shot or, or you know, whatever it was that brought them in, it just brings them right back. So that part makes you bitter. It's easy to get cynical and angry. It's a natural reaction, but one which can diminish us as people and professionals. Sometimes with patients, it's not easy to have empathy for their problem. And I think that when you lose that empathy, uh, that you don't give as good care. The patients that I get emotionally attached to are the patients that do care about themselves and do care about their recovery, have a family support system. And they those remind kind of, you of, of, say, your family, your family or you want to, somebody you that identifies with somebody who you care about. You want to do well for them because they really want to get better. Right. We all know how good we feel when we see how we've been able to help. It's easy to connect with the patients and families we can relate to. But there's a downside. When things don't work out, we end up sharing the grief and the pain. And he was a C6 quad and really just a nervous wreck and he couldn't breathe on his own, his diaphragm didn't work. and. He had a wonderful family, but he himself was just so anxious and he tried everybody's patience. He was very demanding. He didn't cooperate with the care. And I hear on days that I wasn't here, he was really just awful. Because he and I ended up having a really good rapport and, and it'd be days when I'd yell at him and then, you know, then he'd say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And we worked good together, mm -hmm. but then when I wasn't there, Everybody was like, I'm so glad you're back. You can have your primary back, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it was, and so I guess the hardest thing for me was when the sister called and said he died. Probably like maybe a few days after he left here. <laughs> you know, after all that work we had put into it and everything. And then, I don't know, something happened. And, and it's like he said before he left, he's going to die. Did. When we've gotten this close to a patient, invested this much of ourselves in their recovery, their death can be very upsetting. Most of us will try to leave these emotions here at the hospital. Others find it helps to share them with their families. She's supposed to have this done. She usually has this done before I go. Carol Taylor collects pins, and she wears them on her scrubs. Whenever she gets up and gets ready to go to work, the, you know, we usually wash her uniforms and stuff for her, and all the pins have to come off. She needs Each reminds stuff, her so. of someone hmm. or something she does not want to forget. Send her out the door. Um, we had a, a code, I'm going to say four months ago, four or five months ago, of a young woman that was shot in the face at an ATM machine. And um, she was a young woman. Pregnant, she had two small children. It was her daughter's birthday, and she'd gone to the ATM machine to get money to take the family out to dinner when her husband got home, and he was on his way home. And three small children shot her in the face with a handgun and stole sixty dollars. And that woman pops into my head like a a, a a lifelong friend, someone I knew, and she's a stranger. I don't know her name. I don't remember her name, but I can see her face real good, real well. A lot of what we see and do has the power to move us, sometimes deeply. And when our emotions do get the better of us, it doesn't mean we're inadequate or weak. 
It means we haven't lost our humanity. I once wrote something called the Survivor of Psalm, and there's a phrase in it I may never forget, but I need not constantly remember. Well, when you achieve that, you're no less human. You haven't lost the memory of what occurred to you or what occurred to somebody near you. And I don't think we ever lose the ability to, to remember this. But we're not haunted by it. We're not plagued by it. We're not obsessed by it. And we're not demoralized by it. That's what we can achieve. And, and I think uh, collectively, whether we're working as professionals, helping our patients overcome the, the intrusive recollection of the traumatic event, or whether we're helping friends and family deal with it, the end point is you come to terms with reality, and you do remember, and you're changed by it. You're affected by it, but you are not diminished by it. 7.30 It's 7.35 Saturday morning. It was a pretty routine shift. Nothing out of the ordinary. Although it did get pretty intense at times. And there's Bob Wall, you know, with 30 patients. Dr. Sweeney's finished for the night. The modules are someone else's responsibility now. Uh, that needs to be our next topic of conversation. He's on his way home for some well-earned rest. Nobody wins, nobody loses, you know? It's like... People did okay. Uh, they didn't have, like... Uh, some catastrophic, terrible, horrendous events or something, you know? It's just sort of like things worked out, you know? It's not like, uh, we didn't save the world, you know? It's not, the world is not a better place because there happen to be uh, some people here, but, um, but it was okay. I mean, it's just like, things worked out all right. Some of us ended our shifts earlier. Early enough to stop off to talk and unwind after a hard day's night. Hi. Hi, girl. We get pretty close to the people we work with, shift after shift. But that's normal, especially at a hospital like ours. We are really late. We tend to talk a lot at times like these, telling stories. She popped that baby in 20 minutes. You only see every five minutes. Nine and a half pounds. Big baby. Big baby. It helps to share each day's experiences, the good and the bad. We can't keep the emotions of our work bottled up inside. If we do, it can interfere with our relationships, with those we care most about at work and at home. Burnout is a chronic condition caused by the relentless responsibility, the unrelenting pressure, the unpredictability, the intense emotion of trauma work. The antidote is knowing our limits. Acknowledging the emotional risks of this work. Sharing those emotions with our colleagues. Getting enough sleep. Taking breaks when we need them. Having other interests outside the hospital. And asking for help when we need it. Remember. We're all in this together. <laughs>